I'm going to talk about service centres or call centres or contact centres or whatever name you prefer, it doesn't really matter, it's all the same. Just a, a brief kind of agenda what I'm going to be covering today. Interestingly, leading up to this event, um, there's a bit in there that says me and broadband. I'm going to tell you a little story about me trying to transfer my broadband which was just a brilliant experience from my perspective and I thought a perfect example to share with you guys who have, if any of you have gone through this process, will realise how painful it can be. Um, as, as I was kind of thinking back on my fledgling career as a young Vanguard consultant, um, or maybe not so young, uh, I remembered uh, the first time that I'd come across budgets as being an issue. And um, uh, one of my colleagues who's sitting at the back a jolly bearded fellow who will be talking this afternoon to you in a bit more detail. Um, I was there um, at his side, listening and learning. And uh, anyway, we're in a council, I won't mention the council, but we're in a council. And um, my colleague said um, this to the group of senior managers that were sitting in front of him. And the chief executive, he kind of harumphed very loudly and kind of put his papers down on the table, banged them down, and said, no, 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 that's so wrong, that's so wrong. And so my colleague said, well, why is that so wrong? And he said, well, what you don't understand, Debbie, is that we have been an overspending council for many years. This year we're massively overspent. Previous year we're overspent. In fact, for the past six years, we've been an overspending council. So we need these budgets. To which Chevy said, well, it's not bloody working then, is it? <laughs> that was my introduction to budgets. But I'm going to talk about contact centres, service centres. And when I kind of started preparing for this, I thought, I wonder how many people work in that industry. Well, it's a significant number of people. One million, one hundred twenty-five, or there or thereabouts, million people work in this industry. Now, to give that some kind of context, the NHS, the biggest employer in the UK, employs about 1.3 million, and that's around about the fifth largest employer in the world. So we're talking about a significant number of people, and I'm sure everyone in this room probably knows somebody who works someone. But we do interact with them sometimes on a daily basis, and a lot of the time the service we get from them is less than it should be. Let's just call it that. It's not a brilliant um, system. So. How do service centres set up their budgets? Well, this is a very basic um, explanation, but just to give you some kind of idea, they try to understand calls, number of calls they're going to get as, as a basis, or contacts now would be a, a more appropriate uh, way of saying it. So they try to understand how many contacts, and then they try to understand, well, AHT, for those that don't know this, that's average handling time, so how long are the call or the contact going to take? And included in that, it's not just a talk time, but also any wrap-up time at the end of the contact that might have to be done and various other things. From that, they then kind of determine, right, with this number of calls and this amount of time, this is the number of people we need. And then they factor in for holidays, sickness and stuff and add a bit extra on. And then they say, okay, so for this number of teams, how many supervisors, managers we need? And they kind of work out from that. And then they say, well, what do I, how do we work out our targets then? So how do we work out what we need to earn in order to afford this lovely service centre that we've run? So that's what they do for that. So it's a very kind of basic idea of how you get to your numbers. But I thought I'd share that because it's quite a kind of interesting little fact. The unforeseen side of this is that all this budgeting activity which comes to these kind of numbers ends up creating whatever the measures are in the organisation. Now John earlier on talked about a concept of red, amber, green. Now some of you might have that in your organisations where you know if, if, if the numbers, the SLAs are set, if they hit a red number or a red colour they need attention very, very quickly. And managers focus their attention on getting the red turned off. If they're amber, well, there's an action plan to try and get them out of amber into green. And if they're green, generally people don't pay attention to them, which is really, really interesting because the concept which I have understood in all the work I've done in Vanguard is that the amount of game playing that goes on to get it to green is frightening. It's frightening. And MD who works in a system like this plays games. Because if you're red, the focus is on you. It's like a bat light. It just, it's, it's on your face. It's pressure. It's daily. It's conversations. It's justification. It's all this kind of stuff. Nobody wants that. Nobody wants that. 
So the game play to get away from red and into green. And that involves, I think I've said earlier on by yourself, that involves cheating sometimes, quite often actually, if I'm being honest, to get the numbers, because the numbers are everything. If you get bad measures in your organisation, which probably a lot of people would see as bad measures, but if you've got bad measures in your organisation, this is what happens. Now, this is a very obvious example, but I think it perfectly illustrates the point that I'm trying to make. PPI, for those of you that don't, payment protection insurance, the biggest mis-selling scandal in banking history in the UK, it, it, it took over from endowments, that's how bad it was, <coughs> is firmly based in this. And what was the measure? What do you think the measure was for PPI? Anybody? Number Say again? Number sold. number sold. But how did they get to the number sold? Very simple. And this is how simple and destructive bad measures can be because the staff in the banks, insurance companies, credit card companies, were all incentivized to sell this product. So they were getting a bonus as a result of selling it. And what was the bonus based on? Well, it was based on a penetration rate target. In other words, for every loan, credit card, mortgage, whatever it was you sold, a percentage of those sales had to include a PPI product. If you didn't hit your 50% penetration target, then you were put through a disciplinary process. That's how strong the culture was to sell this product, which was massively, massively profitable for these companies. Now, what's interesting about PPI is in August this year, they paid out £260 million in compensation one month. And since the PPI scandal hit and they've been doing repayments, you will not believe how much money they've paid out. 26 billion pounds paid out in compensation. Now we're talking about budgets. Was this in the budget planning in 2010? <laughs> From 2011? No. Incredible. Bad measures, bad behaviour, bad service. So surely the opposite must be true then. Well, in fact it is. You put good measures into your organisation, and what, about, what I mean by that, I just put this up as an example, understanding what matters to your customers is absolutely key, and, and you, you'll hear that many times today, and, and probably have in past Vanguard events, but they're absolutely cl clear, clearly important. And the little line up there says, do our measures help us understand and improve our system? One of, that's one of the tests that we present when we talk about measures. Are the measures you're using, do they pass that simple test? And if they do, good. I've just put some examples from contact centre point of view. This is what matters to your customers over here. This is the kind of information that you want to gather. If you gather this information and act on it, you'll improve your system. You'll improve your service. Customer experience will be better. Staff morale will be better. Your costs will go down. In fact, every time I've done this, it's worked. Let me just give you a little example. So I've been doing some work in a, an insurance broker this year. And... I've done work for insurance companies before. With insurance, it's mostly car insurance, household insurance, that kind of stuff. Um, but they sell other forms of insurance. Um, as a customer, we've got lots of choice now in terms of where we go. We've got lots of comparison sites. We've got lots of other places. As a broker, they, do, they don't use comparison sites because they want to be the comparison site. They want to be the comparison person you go to. So anyway, a heavily... Um, scripted environment now. So the staff in the front line have to follow a particular script to get the customers to the end. That script and how they work in there with the traditional measures, if you like, with average handling time, um, things like you know, sales targets, add-on targets, and, the, and that kind of stuff, um, it drives people to act in a particular way, which isn't to the benefit of the customer. Now, what's interesting about this system, the broker system, is of the customers that contact this company, <laughs> more than 90% of them don't buy. And that's incredible. 
more than 90% of the customers who physically and actively find out their number, phone them up and want to buy something, don't buy. That's amazing. Can you imagine a supermarket where 90% of the customers walked in and walked straight back out again without buying it? It's just incredible. But in that environment, it's normal. They don't see this as a problem. They don't see the fact of how they are interacting with customers as responsible for that. They see this as a customer choice thing. What they don't understand is these customers want the product. So why aren't they selling that? I mean, it's, it is incredible. So one of the things that we did, and I did, with the, with the guys I was working with, is I said, let's, as an experiment, let's just take a small group of people, which is a nice way to start, start small. Take about 12 people. Let's separate them from all the nonsense that's going on everywhere else. Let's talk to customers. <laughs> That's this amazing concept. Right? Let's listen to what they're going to ask. Move the script aside. Talk to them. Find out what it is that they want. Find out if anything in their lifestyle has changed over the last couple of years, because it probably has. Find out if that's going to influence them in terms of their insurance needs. Ask them what they actually want for their insurance product. There's a question that's quite a interesting one. <laughs> it matters to you about your insurance. And see, when you start opening up a conversation and having a proper conversation with a customer, you'll be amazed at what they tell you. At that point, with their expertise, because they were expert, these guys, they can then say, oh, that's really interesting. Well, did you know that? Did you know this? What do you think happened? Sales went up. Oh, shock horror, right? My God, who knew? Sales went up. One other thing, though, which was interesting. One of the key drivers in, in most of these places, although a lot of them deny it now, but it's true, is average handling time is a big driver for behavior. You know, if you're taking too long in your conversations, it's frowned upon because obviously, with that being a massive budget um, constraint, it's something that they're very fearful of. I'm not fearful of it at all, <laughs> not in the slightest. And I'll tell you why, because when you look at the demand coming into contact centers, the vast majority of it is customers phoning with problems. It's failure demand. Now, if you think about it, if you could reduce failure demand, which can account, as I'll show you later on, for about 70% of what comes into these places, average handling time is no longer an issue. If you can reduce 40% of the calls, how much time have you just created? It's incredible. So, by spending more time on the phone, more time talking to people, more time understanding, you're less likely to make bad decisions and bad choices with the customers, which means less likely are they to phone back in with problems, which are taking up the valuable time that you should be used for selling. So it's a simple bit of mathematics. Convincing people of that, of course, is another thing because they're so wed to these kind of ideas. But anyway, we did this, then average time the time did increase. But the failure demand dropped, and actually we ended up with more capacity. Other interesting fact was the sales went up by 25% within about three weeks. Now that's just incredible. Understanding demand is where I always start, any contact center. And it's simple stuff, right? Value demand, sale demand. Typically, that's kind of what you see in these contact centers. And different organizations obviously can be different, but in contact centers, 70% failure is normal. Nowadays, obviously, how we contact companies has developed and changed, and there's loads of different ways now of doing it, but it doesn't make it any more difficult to understand. You've just got to be where that demand happens and understand how to analyze it. But from a customer's point of view, we put customers online because we think it's easier for customers. We don't. We think it's cheaper. Organizations think it's cheaper. And interestingly, every time I've seen a new online system get put in, it's more expensive. Because you've got that cost plus all the ongoing cost of dealing with the failure that falls off the back of that. And I always say to people, you're going to have to employ, employ more people in your contact centre if you're going to put an online system in. Don't be so ridiculous, John. Customers are going to choose that route. They're going to not call us. No, no, they're going to call you because they can't get on. They don't understand it. They, they can't get verified. Because you've designed it in a way that the perfect example is, nobody's perfect. Everybody's got a different variation of what they want, so it just doesn't work. They'll fall out right through, and that's what happens. They fall out at various stages of the process, and what do they do? They phone. If you can find a phone number, because they hide them. 
They hate people phoning, but people are really good at finding stuff. And there's a thing called Google that works perfectly, by the way, if you want to find their phone number. Anyway. So just a little quick example of online demand into, in this case, a university, but a little service center. They were getting loads of demand for prospectuses, so they thought, and they were sending out 30, 40,000, whatever the number was, prospectuses. And I, I was doing a little bit of work with distance learning students, and we said, right, okay, let's understand how the, this works. The demand for I want a prospectus online, the demand for I want more information ended up in the same inbox. Now that's a piece of brilliant design if I've ever heard it. So how did they deal with that? Well, they sent their prospectus. Now, the prospectus information was 100% the same as it was online. On the website, 100% identical. What do you think people did when they got the prospectus? They phoned and said, that doesn't answer the question I wanted. So when we started talking to them and said, well, is it a prospectus you want? Or is it information you want? No, I need more information. I need clarity on X, Y, Z. All right, well, let's deal with that. And the students in that distance learning course, they actually increased the numbers because they were listening and understanding what mattered to students. It's amazing. So what's the magic trick? Right, make it visible. How do you do that? Well, you analyze demand. You understand it from two different levels. So high level demand, you know, I am chasing, for example, the high level demand. Low level demand, what it is I'm chasing about. So you can analyze your demand like that. How do we deal with it? Do we deal with it immediately at that point? Do we pass it on? Do we pass it back? Why do we pass it on? Why do we pass it back? That's the kind of stuff that you want to understand in a contact center. Because a perfect contact center is all value demand, one stop. How many do you think work like that? Okay, so here's the hidden cost. So this is something that organizations don't understand. Last year's Rich Report surveyed 7,000 customers. Who were the top three for poor service? What's interesting, I said earlier on broadband and me, right? I'm going to tell you a little story. So, about five weeks ago, six weeks ago, I decided to move my broadband from Sky to BT. Anyway, I went online to do my online application. My address does not exist, by the way. I don't live anywhere, apparently, according to their <laughs> website. But it just doesn't exist. Now, what's interesting with BT is I've had BT Sport for about 10 years or whatever they brought it out. So I'm on their system somewhere, but my address didn't exist. So I had to find the phone number, hence the little story earlier on. I found the phone number, phoned up, spoke to this guy in Glasgow, and said, my address doesn't exist. <laughs> don't be silly. Of course it exists. I'll find it. Your address doesn't exist. I said, I know it doesn't exist. Um, so he said, oh, what I'm going to have to do, um, I'm going to have to send a BT Outreach guy out to see if you exist. <laughs> I said, OK. I said, see if you check BT Sport, you'll see it exists, but you don't exist in this system. Right, OK. I've had a phone number for it. Yeah, it doesn't matter. My house was built in 1879, by the way. It's a semi-detached, and my next door neighbor exists. <laughs> who, who knows, right? Anyway. So I said, but the, uh, little thing, right? The reason I'm swapping is it's a special online deal. Don't worry about that, I'll put notes in the account. Once this gets sorted, it's not your fault. Once this gets sorted, it'll be good. Right, cool. So, they come. They won't phone me back. I have to phone them in four weeks. That's the arrangement. Four weeks. So, I phone them back, four weeks. Say, hello, it's me. Oh, hello, you. Um, I said, so this is the story. This is the deal I got. That's an online deal. I know, don't worry about that. Guys left notes in my account. I, I work for an outsourced company for part of BT, so I can't get access to your notes. But I'll pass you through to Glasgow because they've got access to your notes. Fine. So they pass me through to Glasgow. Hi, how you doing? Hi, how you doing? Here's the story. All right, okay. Guy said left notes. No problem. Oh, he hasn't left notes. Ah, right, okay. Um, well, I've got this special online deal I was interested in. There's no notes in the system. Do you have a screen print? Well, what? No. Ah, sorry, there's nothing I can do. What do you mean there's nothing I can do? Oh, I, 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 want this. I don't see these things. They're online. I know it's an online deal, right? Okay, so I'll put you through it to Newcastle because there's an options team in Newcastle. They'll take a note of this. It'll be sorted very quickly. Don't worry about it. Fine, thank you. Speak to Newcastle. This is what's happened. Oh, that's terrible. What I'll do is I'll leave notes and I'll get somebody to call you back and that person will sort it out for you. I said, this is a deal. I said, that's an online deal. I said, I know it's an online deal. I get that. I said, but that was the deal I was promised at the time. Oh, okay. And that's, I'll just add that to the notes. Then I got a phone call and I said to the guy, I said, so... 
where, where are you then? He says, oh, I'm in India. I went, oh, that's fantastic. He said, so I believe you want broadband. Yeah, brilliant. He said, well, it's going to cost this. I said, no, 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 that's not the deal that I wanted. The deal that I was promised was this. That's an online deal. I said, I know it's an online deal. <laughs> I said, well, that's the deal I want. I can't offer you that deal. I'll offer you this deal. I went, fine, I'll take it. I'll send you an email. Send me an email. The email was wrong. So I phoned back to the Glasgow Service Centre. I spoke to Susan. I said, Susan, this is what's happened. She went, that's terrible. You must be really angry. I'll give you a fiver off. Fine. Let's just do it. I can't give you a fiver off. The system won't let me do it. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to pass it to the outbound team in India who then phoned you back and said, but I offered you a different deal. You can't get a fiver off. I said, but the guy from Glasgow, the girl, says, no, I will have to put you in Newcastle now. So then they put me in Newcastle and the guy said in the auction, no, listen, I get this, but I can't deal with it. I'm going to give you the customer assist because customer assist, they'll sort this problem out for you. So I spoke to the customer assist guy and he says, but that's an online deal. <laughs> I said, I know it's an online deal. I said, but I was promised at the time, I'll give you the online team in India. At this point, I've been on the phone for about an hour and 15 minutes. I explained the story to the girl in India and she cuts me off. That is not a good thing. So I phoned the customer complaint team. The guy said, oh, I'm really sorry. I'll take a note of this. I'll get Sunday from the customer complaint team. Phone you back tomorrow. Send you a text message to, to guarantee that. Although it's between 8 in the morning and 9 at night, somebody will definitely phone you. They didn't phone me. So I phoned back the next day and cancelled. No, that's just fantastic. One online <laughs> transaction turns into that. How often are customers experiencing that? Now, what is the hidden cost here? I've just used this as a little example to give you a view. Staff, 1,000 staff. I wish I had the time of this. This is the number of calls, the number of time they're on the phone. If failure demand at 70%, that costs companies about that. Plus all of this. Now, that's 1,000 staff. How many people work in these centres? What's the cost in terms of budgets to this economy? It's frightening. Four billion pounds it could be up to. And that's unbelievable. So here's just a few things to finish off, just to think about. This is the stuff you don't do. This is the stuff not to do. But this is what they all do. So what do we do instead? This is what we do. We have the right measures, engage staff, Remove waste. Get good knowledge. I like this, though. I, I like this. Leadership is a verb. It's not a noun. It's about actively getting involved and engaged in the process. And my final thing is I've redefined budgets. And budgets, to me, now mean this. Thank you very much.